Today we're going to dive into Digital Command Control or DCC and some of the myths and misconceptions that have been brought up over time. I remember when I first started with DCC as well, I had a number of misconceptions more born out of misinformation and me not educating myself to a correct level of some of the, the myths and misconceptions about DCC control. But fear not, we're going to go through the top 10 misconceptions and maybe a few little other ones that might help you ease your mind to get into DCC control and navigate you through the electronics of it. So enough of the waffle, let's get started. DCC is too complicated for beginners. All right, let's address the elephant in the room. Is DCC too complicated for the beginners? Nope, not at all. When I started, I was a little bit nervous about the technical side of things. But you know what, I just threw myself into a path of learning all I could. DCC is designed to be user friendly. You don't need to be an electronics guru to get started. There are some fantastic entry level DCC systems out there with intuitive interfaces that make it a breeze to operate. Myth number two, converting to DCC is expensive. Now, this myth might have held me back at the beginning also, but let me tell you, let me tell you, converting to DCC doesn't need to break the bank. Yes, there are some high-end systems like this, Roco Z21 black box, that are reasonably expensive, but however, it's like anything in life, you get what you pay for. So if you're willing to pay something, some good money up front, you're gonna get a great DCC system that you're gonna be able to expand into and grow as your needs require over time. Starting out buying, by starting out buying a cheaper starter set with a DCC command station, a locomotive and some basic rolling stock and maybe some track is a lot more cost effective way of getting into DCC. Rome wasn't built in a day either. Moderating is a marathon, not a sprint. Myth number three, DCC requires extensive knowledge of electronics. You know me, I'm tech and electronics is my thing. I wouldn't say I'm, I'm any guru though when it comes to this discipline within DCC. However, this didn't stop me from taking on a path of learning and educating myself on how I wanted, how best I wanted to achieve my own goals with my DCC system. On a whole, there's no no need to be overwhelmed by the DCC. On a whole, it's majoritively from the bigger companies, their plug and play products that are have great user manuals, have some good support via some forums, and reasonably easy to and, and that are reasonably easy to get functioning right out of the box. Probably the biggest piece of advice here when it comes to DCC tech, particular, let's say occupancy detection is to break down a circuit, possibly a wire at a time. So wiring in one occupancy detection section, testing it, and then going on to the next one. And then as time you build your confidence in wiring DCC, that you can wire, say, a whole 16 bank occupancy detection module all off the bat, test it, and then you're good to go. Myth number four, analog DCC locomotives cannot be converted to DCC. Um, I used to worry about this at the beginning also. It was a bit of a concern that you had to put a DCC decoder in each individual locomotive. However, in time, they have come down significantly in price. You can, on a whole, convert older locomotives over to DCC. However, there are some inherent problems that you might have to work through, e.g. maybe some of the old Shinto, um Tenshoto brass or something similar might be a little more problematic for the beginner. So let's start with something maybe it's a little bit easier to convert in the first instant. Yet again, there's plenty of groups out there. Go to your local local club. I'm sure there's some members there that can help you through how to convert your DCC locomotives. Probably the biggest piece of advice here, just be mindful of the, the manufacturer's specifications when it comes to the output of the DCC decoder, sometimes the older motors are a little bit current hungry and they can damage some DCC decoders. So just give it some advice and you should be okay. Myth number five, DCC is only good for large layouts. Um, I've heard this one too, but let me tell you, DCC is perfect for any size layout. I've got a reasonably large layout, so DCC is perfect for me. However, even if it was a, an eight by four, where I wanted to run two or three trains around, I think DCC would be a lot easier for me to wire and a lot less problematic with limited electronic skills like myself. 
the beauty of DCC lies in its scalability. So you get a very basic, just a looper track, running one or two locomotives around. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. Just to get you into the hobby, that's fantastic. But the beauty of the DCC, it means you can control multiple trains independently at various accessories and manage your whole layout with with relative ease. It's like having a traffic control center for your model railway. Super cool, right? Before we go on to myth number six, let's get some words from our sponsor, PCB Way. Over to you guys and gals. This video is proudly sponsored by PCBWay.com. If you're a tinkerer, inventor, or advanced electrical engineer, you need to check out PCB Way, or you are seriously missing out. They are passionate about PCBs, ranging from standard to advanced PCBs with one to 30 layers with full featured printed circuit boards. PCB Way don't stop there. They offer basically everything you need to make your ideas a reality. Whether you need 3D prints, injection molding or CNC machining, assembly or basic PCB manufacturing, they can do it all for highly competitive prices. Check out their awesome services in the link below and their offer to my viewers who support this channel. Watch out for my upcoming videos where I'll be using some of their products. Myth number six, DCC systems are not user friendly. I've got to say, I've used a few different DCC systems over the years, the Roco Z21, the Lens, and also the Digikais DR5000. And I believe as time has got on, they've become more user friendly um, and a lot easier for me to use. But it's like any new system, you have to learn how to use it. They are all, they are all a little bit different in how, how, they, are, how they operate. But if you're willing to give it some time and some practice and some run some trains around, and who doesn't like running some trains, you too will be able to learn a new DCC system. So the throttles are reasonably intuitive in their use. Yes, there are some menus you can dive into that you probably don't need to know too much about in the early times when you're just trying to learn. Um, DCC companies have spent a lot of time and research and development in trying to get the user interfaces to be able to be used for multiple skill sets and people with varying knowledge. So ultimately don't let this side of things scare you away from getting into DCC. Reading DCC voltages with a normal multimeter, this is actually fault. Voltage, track voltages, DCC track voltages, you need a special device, such as a RA ramp meter from Tony's Trains in the United States. Over the years, I've used these with great success. Now these will give you an accurate track voltage and also an amperage output that your system is currently drawing on. Um, I've done a previous video on this. If you want some more information about DCC and the actual shape of the electrical wave, so to speak, you might pay to get yourself one of these, which is a little handheld oscilloscope. This too can also read the track voltages. However, if you can't pony up enough funds regarding an, a, uh, an RR ramp meter or an oscilloscope, some multimeters will give you a rough guide of voltage at the track if you are to set them to AC, but it's not gonna give you an accurate outcome. DCC will become outdated and be replaced. I often have to laugh at this one. The DCC as a, a format is never going, I don't believe it's gonna be replaced, it's here to stay. Yes, there's gonna be better technology, better command stations, better boosters, better controllers, better locomotives, and everything that comes along with life and electronics, there is going to be advancements in DCC. However, DCC as a protocol is here to stay. Also, DCC has been around for 30 to 40 plus years now. Um, I've probably used it for 30 of those years myself. As pointed out, DCC is evolving at a rapid pace like most technology in this world right now. So don't let that hold you back with those advancements. You don't always have to have the, the newest and the most updated command station, let's say. There's also a lot of room for being able to pick up some great secondhand offers. Turnouts must be replaced with DCC friendly versions. Um, this is very false. There really is no such thing as a DCC friendly turnout, so to speak. They'll often, you'll be able to run them on AC, DC, or DCC. However, DCC, depending on 
DCC, depending on some older brands, you may have to do a few little tweaks here and there to get better running reliability with them. A turnout on your layout has worked robustly with a DC system, more than likely it's gonna work fine with a DCC. And if not, there might be a few little tweaks here and there as I've already pointed out. But if, if you are just getting back into the hobby or you're redoing a whole, whole new layout, I can highly recommend I use the Roco Electro Frogs. I personally like them. So what is an Electro Frog? This is where the frog is totally isolated from the rest of the turnout or the point, so to speak. And then the phase or the A and B rail as the turnout is turned from to the straight ahead to the diverging branch, let's say, is gonna be different. That power is then rerouted via an external method like a, a relay or what I use also is the circuitron tortoise motors which allow you to do that. Boosters with higher current are better for DCC. So I'm gonna say this is false, but there is a however with this or an exception. In short, the false part of it, oversized boosters, so we're talking about 10 amps plus, have too much current or smaller scales. The proviso, unless you're gonna go and start installing something like this, which is a DCC Specialties PSXX circuit breaker, that is a bit of a bit of a mouthful. However, so what they actually do, they act as a circuit breaker like they would in a house. So you can have that one 10 amp booster farmed into or connected into many different power districts to run your motor railway. And then you are then electrically protected from any shorts that are gonna do some any real damage to your motor railway. Be mindful, don't rely on the short protection mechanisms or circuitry with your DCC. They are designed to, when they short, they will shut down the command station or the boosters to protect them. They're not designed to protect the locomotive or anything downstream of the system. So you just got to remember some of these. You just got to remember some of these high boost, uh, high current boosters, where people can run foul with them, is when they short out, they can spike up to 60 plus amps. So you can understand that's not gonna go all down all that well with a very, very sensitive DCC sound decoder. DCC has positive and negative at the track. So this goes a little, couples a little bit along the lines of being able, the other myth that I spoke of before in regards to being able to use a normal multimeter to test track voltage at the track of your DCC signal. This is not true, they don't have a negative and a positive. So the DCC signal is binary in nature. So what that is, what that means is, so, so if you've got 14 volts to your track, you have a 14 volt positive at track, say track A, and the other track's going to be zero volts. And that will rotate from track to track. So it's not always gonna be track A that's gonna have the 14 volts and track B the zero. They will change, they will phase. The two rails are always in opposite in phase or state. When a phase happens, the relationship between the two rails are then also inverted, so they will swap. So this is where we get our another misnomer, and that's sort of a, a sub a sub myth, I suppose, of this one. And I too was guilty of this in the early days, probably more to do with terminology than anything. It's not the polarity, but the phase. So when we get a phase mismatch, you that's when you get your short circuit. So when you've got a, say, a reversing loop and you've got your 14 volts, and also then you've got, you're dividing in your track or your, your insulated fish plates. When that train comes back around that loop, if you don't have a, a module that changes the phase of that given track, you're gonna have a short circuit. So well, there you have it, folks. That's the end of the video. We've gone through, in no particular ranking order, myths regarding DCC. I hope my personal experience with this has maybe helped you decide whether you think DCC is right for you or not, because knowledge is power when it comes to things like this. And with that knowledge comes, hopefully puts, puts your mind at ease to make an informed decision. DCC, 
from my point of view, has opened up a vast world of controllability, scalability, and just ultimately having a significant amount of fun without getting bogged down with some very, very technical wiring that was more inherent to the DC world. And I hope fun and excitement, as I have gained from this part of the hobby, will be afforded to yourself also. So take that leap of faith, get into DCC, and just be prepared, it's gonna be an electrifying journey of model rarity. Like with all my other videos, I have three questions. So number question number one is, what myths regarding DCC have you have you come across? Is there any that any of the major ones or glaring ones that I might have missed out? Just make sure you put these in the comments below. So, what sort of myths did you need to de debunk in the early days of when you got into DCC? Or on the flip side of that, was there enough negative press out there, so to speak, with all the myths that actually kept you away from DCC? And number three, like always, how could I have done this better? Please comment in the description below in regards to that aspect. As always, happy model railroading. See you in the next video. God bless, and I'll see you next time. Make sure you subscribe. Click that little bell icon to be notified of upcoming videos. Support us on Patreon. Like us on Facebook and Instagram at Model Railroad Technique.